Okay. The boat is being pulled in by a rope attached to a winch on a five meter high dock. The rope is being pulled in at a rate of sure looking kind of fast, two meters per second. When the boat is 12 meters from the bottom of the dock. How fast is the distance from the boat to the bottom of the dock changing? Um. So as is usual, we want to draw a picture. Let's see, so a dock. All right, so here's my dock. It's like something in the water. Uh, probably too much. I probably don't need that much picture. Oh, well, too much picture. Thank you. And here's my boat coming in. Here's the winch, here's the boat. Okay. So obviously we're gonna label some things. Um, this length, right? The length from the boat to the bottom of the dock. Let's call that X. How unoriginal. And let's call the length from the boat to the winch. I usually use S for diagonal lengths. You can use anything you want. People use Z frequently. People typically do not use D. So the reason we don't use D for distance, I think the reason is probably because no one wants to write D, 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 T. It just looks weird. For some reason, picking D for the variable there is just like something people don't do. So we don't typically use that. And then this distance here is the height of the dock. That's not changing. That's just five meters. Okay. Got our picture. And again, for those of you that just walked in or just came to us, or the setup is a boat is being pulled in by a rope attached to a winch on a five meter high dock. The rope is being pulled in at two meters per second. When the boat is 12 meters from the bottom of the deck, sorry, bottom of the dock, how fast is the distance from the boat to the bottom of the dock changes? I will point out, um, right, I know that eventually this distance here is going to be 12 meters, but I'm not writing 12 in there because this distance is changing. So I need a variable for that. So I'm probably another page right now. So, so now they've got our picture. Let's identify all the things. The things that are changing. So we know that ds dt is what we want to find. Actually, no, ds dt is what we know. We want to know. We know what ds dt is. We want to know what dx dt is. So scratch that. We know that DSD is how fast is that rope getting pulled in that? Two meters per second. DSDT is two meters per second. And we want to find how fast the distance from the boat to the dock is changing. That's going to be what we're looking for. And most of the times when you've got right triangles involved, usually, oh, this is, oh, I got one. We're going to do one more question after this. this is a, Usually when you've got right triangles involved, you're either using the Pythagorean theorem or maybe some similar triangles. Most of the time, Pythagorean theorem. So this one, our equation is going to be x squared plus y squared equals s squared. I have to be careful to make sure my s's and five's look different. Now we're going to differentiate. And this one's not, this one's not particularly exciting, but there is a point that I want to illustrate here. The derivative of some stuff squared is two times my stuff to the first times the derivative of the stuff. The derivative of five squared is zero. The derivative of s squared is two times s times the first thing. And now if we start plugging things in, 
we know that X is supposed to be 12, right? Because we're being asked how fast is how fast is our thing supposed to be when the boat is 12 meters from the bottom of the deck. So we're going to plug in X equal to 12, 12 meters. I'm going to plug in the units so you guys can see all the things. DX is what we're trying to find. Equal to two times. Okay. Everybody should be able to tell me this answer without doing the work. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. If this side is five and this side is 12, how much is the hypotenuse of that triangle? It's everyone's second favorite Pythagorean triple. It's not three, four, five. It's five, 12, 15. That one comes up pretty frequently too. So it is worth just knowing if the legs are five and 12, the hypotenuse is 13 or any multiples, right? If it was 50, 120, then the hypotenuse should be 130. You can do the work too, but it's kind of, no one's really, no one's expecting you to really do that work necessarily. Like they're happy if you do it, but they're also like, yeah, they just knew it was 13 in final. So that's gonna be 13 meters times DSDT, which is two meters per second. And um, we can cancel a two here and here. And then I can divide the by 12. So the DX DT is gonna be 26 meters times meters per second, divided by 12 meters, cancel the meters. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna reduce that to 13 over six meters per second. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that, apologies. And this was the way the problem was asked in Desmos, for example, this would probably be wrong. I made a small mistake. And the mistake is the following. So let's back to this original problem. The setup is S getting bigger or smaller if you pull that rope in? It's smaller, meaning DSDT should actually be negative to. And then when we calculate this, we're going to end up getting dx dt being negative 13.6, which makes sense in the context of our picture because the length x is getting smaller. And specifically, they ask the question how fast is the distance from the boat to the bottom of the dock changing? Right? The distance is not increasing, so the rate of change shouldn't be positive. The distance is decreasing, so it should be negative. I know on guys' homework, there's a ladder going down a thing problem. And when the ladder, so when the ladder's like sliding down the wall, that part of the wall is distance is getting smaller. So that rate of change should be negative. And when it slides out, that part's positive. So if you set it up wrong, you'll end up getting a positive answer when you should get a negative answer or vice versa. And then you end up getting a negative when you should get a positive. So you always need to be careful about if things are getting smaller, the rate of change is negative. If things are getting larger, the rate of change is positive. Let's get one more kind of classic example, and then we will start talking about some exponential growth in the case stuff and maybe some Newton's law of cooling. So, yeah, what's his, uh, my, I know this example. What's his, oh yeah. Um, six foot tall person. Call her Alice because I know a woman named Alice who is six feet tall. She is quite tall. Um, is walking away from a street light, um, a 20 foot tall street light, at a pace of four feet per second. When Alice is 11 feet from the base of the streetlight, how fast is the length of her shadow increasing? I guess I gave part of it away. How fast is the length of her shadow changing? It is important um, language to pay attention to. If someone says increasing, you know that's supposed to be a positive rate of change. If someone says something is decreasing, it's supposed to be a negative rate of change. 
Um, it can be kind of terrible when someone says, how fast is it decreasing? Which is then it's kind of okay to say the answer is a positive number. Like you can say that something is deep, like the previous question, for example, you could totally say that the distance between the boat and the dock is decreasing at positive 13.6 meters per second. And that's an acceptable way of writing it. So just be careful with the language. All right, let's have a picture. Um, street light. There's the sun, except not. There's the street. There's Alice over here. And then the sh I didn't make it. I should make her look a little bit taller. Let's make let's make her a little bit taller. Okay, now my picture is terrible. Not that it was so good before, but you know, Alice has a weird number of limbs. That's all right. I'm not weird. Atypical. Atypical. Okay, so here's the length of her shadow. I'm going to call that X. What else do I know? Well, actually, in fact, not even what else. Let's back up and talk about where I should start. I mean, I know I should draw the picture and label the things that are changing, but when I start thinking about what's changing, I know two things. Well, I know one thing. I want to know another thing. I know how fast she's walking. So she's walking at four feet per second. I want to write that as a derivative though. I probably need to label something else. Because if someone's walking at some speed, you're saying their rate of change is something. But if you're talking about their position, you kind of have to measure it against some stationary object. So I kind of need to label the distance from Alice to the base of the street lamp as y or whatever variable you want to pick so that I can say, oh, that distance is increasing at four feet per second. So dy dt is four feet per second. And then we want to know what is dx dt, how fast her shadow is increasing in length. Oh, and I should have labeled how tall things are. Alice is a good six feet. And the street lamp is a good 20 feet. And this is definitely not a Pythagorean theorem kind of setup. We want to kind of write a, an equation relating X and Y. It's definitely going to be a similar triangles kind of deal. So I might say something like, x is to 6, right? this base is to this height, as this base is to this height, as x plus y is to 20. Um, and before we differentiate both sides, you totally could differentiate right now. Sometimes it does pay to make things a little bit easier. Like, I would rather maybe cross multiply here and say, 20x equals 6x plus 6y. And then maybe even make my life a little bit easier and subtract 6x from both sides. And say 14x equals 6y. That seems pretty nice. Seems worth doing. So now we're going to differentiate. The derivative of 14x is 14 times the derivative of x. Your 6y is 6 times the derivative of y. And then we're going to plug in what we know. We know that she's 11 feet from the base, so y should be 11. There's nowhere to put that in my equation. That happens sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't matter how far the person is from the thing or how, right? Um, but we do know that the y dt is four feet per second. So 14 times dx dt equals six times four feet per second. And solving for dx dt, we get dx dt equal to 24 over 14, or if you prefer, 12 over seven. Feet per second. 
So interestingly, if in this situation, if she's walking away from the street lamp at four feet per second, it doesn't matter how far she is from it, her shadow is always going to be increasing at a rate of 12, seven feet per second. Kind of neat. I mean, obviously, obviously we're making a lot of assumptions about how light works. Like she can't be super far away from the light, otherwise it's not going to cast a shadow, but that's the idea. If the, if the shadow could always be cast, it would always be increasing at 12 points in the foot per second. And there's another people ask this question, but I don't think it's a, I feel like that's more something to do in 16A, not in 17A. So just as, just as a quick note, sometimes people say, instead of how fast is the length of the shadow increasing, sometimes they ask, how fast is the tip of the shadow moving? Which is different, but really easy to answer if you've done this part first. So how fast is this tip moving? Well, I'm really just asking, how fast is this distance changing? We already know that. We know that this distance is changing at four feet per second, and this distance is changing at 12 seven feet per second. So if they want to know how fast is the tip of the shadow moving, it's really just the derivative of x plus y. So we know the derivative of x plus y, it's the derivative of x plus the derivative of y. And we already found those things. Well, we already told one of them. Dx dt we found, it was 12 sevenths, and dy dt is four. And adding those together, you would get 40 sevenths or foot per second. I don't care so much about the numbers here, but just the idea that, oh yeah, if your shadow is moving this fast, and you're walking this fast, then the end of the shadow is moving at the speeds added together. So, related rates. It's always the same, like four or five steps. They're usually not too terrible. Um, you just have to be kind of precise about it. I mean, not, not that you can be super imprecise about other things, but take extra care with related rates. Like you go through these four steps every time, it should work out just fine. Just make sure that you definitely take the derivative of both sides before you start plugging stuff in. That's kind of like the number, the number two pieces of advice I can give. The number one piece of advice being draw a picture. So draw a picture for sure. And then when you do this stuff, make sure you differentiate before plugging in. Do you have any questions about related rates? Okay. I know we did quite a few of them, so I hope there's not too many questions, but obviously if you have questions, you're welcome to ask them. Any questions from the, from the Zoom people? No, okay. Um, all right, let's let's move along. Talk about exponential growth and decay. So exponential growth. And decay. And I'll point out everyone's going to assume you've seen the model for exponential growth or decay before, even if you haven't seen it. So here's the model. So it's the model for growth slash decay is y equal to c e to the k t. Um, a couple notes, thank you. C is the initial amount of stuff we have. Um, my typical go to thoughts are bacteria for growth, radioactive material for decay. And then the other thing to know is that if K is positive, we have growth. If K is negative, we have decay. We typically don't do that thing where people put a minus sign on K if it's negative. Like that's not a thing we do in 17 or just calculus or whatever. I know people do that in chemistry classes sometimes. It's totally fine to do. It's just unnecessary. K will just be negative if it's negative and we don't have to like put a minus sign to show that. But it's fine too if you want. 
I'll show you what I mean. Um, and here's what I want you all to see. If we take the derivative, so again, we, can, we should be thinking of this as, right, y is a function of t. So y is the amount of stuff. Amount at time t, and t is the time. Yes, there are other things that, t, that sometimes your input is not time. Sometimes it's like, it's usually time. <laughs> Trying to think of another example where it's not time. It's usually almost always time. It cannot be time, but often it's time. So usually you think about it time. But I want you to see that if we take the derivative of this, so take the derivative of c e to the kt. So the constant multiple hangs out. And the derivative of e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And the derivative of kt is just k. But here's what I really want you to notice. That's the original function. All right, we started with y equals c to the kt. We differentiated it and we got c to the kt times k. So what this actually can show us is that this is coming from the differential equation dy dt equals k times y. So this is what's called a differential equation. It's an equation that has a function y and one or more of its derivatives, dy dt. What's the solution to this differential equation? We already know it. The solution to this differential equation, we started with the solution, worked backwards. But I'm just going to point out is the function y of t equal to c t to the kt. So when someone asks you, and you will be asked at some point, not today, but like in the near future, if you're ever asked to solve a differential equation, the solution is the function. And it's not like a number, it's not a numerical answer, it's literally the function c to the kt. So for example, if we wanted to solve dy dt equal to say 3y, well, we know what the solution is, right? We know if it's dy dt equals ky, the solution is y of t equals c to the kt, and it's replacing the k with 3. So the solution is going to be y of t equals c e to the 3. C is still up for grabs, right? C could end up being anything still. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but we might have something else, right? Maybe ask to solve like dp dt equal to 0.05y. Not y. It's not even right. It's right p. Sorry, my, my own notes are betraying me here. Um, this, these variables should match. And the y here and the y there should be the same. The p here and the p there should be the same. And our solution here is going to be exactly p as a function of time equal to c e to the 0 0.05. It's just a pattern. Similarly, if you had dA dt equal to negative 3.6 times. A, I should say, I'll say, when we write this, we are all making the assumption correctly that A is a function of time. Like when I write dA dt, oh, that's telling me A depends on time. So you could write your answer as A equal to C e to the negative 3.6 times P, but I think it's to your benefit to remind yourself that, oh yeah, A is a function of time. And A of T is equal to C e to the negative 3.6 times T. 
Definitely not required, but I think it's helpful. OK, what is K? Or I guess a better question, what does K represent? Well, let's think about this in terms of population. If we have dp dt equal to 0 0.05 times p, and again, I'm going to talk about p. Well, we know what the solution is, right? I don't really care if the, the p of t is equal to c e to the 0 0.05 times t. What I care about really more is that p of t is the population at time t, which is this right there. Can someone tell me what dp dt means? Or that's not excellent. But my question is not excellent, but I don't know how to make it better. So. It's a rate of change, it's how fast the, right, exactly. And we know it's increasing because it's positive, right? This, I mean, the population is definitely positive. You can have a negative population of people, not a thing. Um, so that's positive, that's positive, meaning whatever this is, it's equal to a positive number. So this part here is the rate of population growth. And not surprisingly, we in this situation, we see that the rate of population growth is a multiple of the population size. Right? The more people you have, the more people you can make. So as the number of people increases, the rate of population growth also increases. Um, but that's not very informative. Right? If I told you the population was increasing at 100 people per year, that might be really a lot. That might be not hardly any at all, right? If you're talking about in the United States, that's nothing. If you're talking about in my hometown of Arcata, 15,000 people, that's kind of a lot. So the context is important here, meaning right, if we take this and we divide it by P, which is equal to 0 0.05 in this case, this is called the per capita growth rate. That's a little more meaningful, right? It's actually like, okay, if I know the DP DT is 100 and the population is 15,000, then, well, that's not the right number, so this example, but that's telling me, oh, yeah, we actually know what the growth rate is per some number of people. It doesn't matter if the population is 15,000 or a million, we're still going to get the same idea of value here. Um, so you can call this the per capita growth rate, also known as the relative. And that's kind of the hallmark of exponential growth is that the relative growth rate is constant. It's kind of the kind of a big deal. So exponential growth or decay. occurs when the relative growth or decay rate is constant. Okay. So let's look at a couple of examples. Usually, also, although we talk about this, mm, no, actually, I should let me actually talk about one of them first. Um, yeah, let's just sorry, keep going back and forth between what I want to say. Let's do this. So, bacteria culture. 
initially contains two hundred cells. It grows. At a rate, oh, sorry, of course, it went too high, proportional to its size. After one hour, the population is. Mm, 840 cells. Question one, what is the population size after T hours? This is another way of just saying, find the model. In fact, we should back up a little bit because what is the model? Well, there's some key words I wrote that we have to identify. Specifically, it grows at a rate proportional to its size. Those are the words that indicate, oh, we have exponential growth. So when we see those words, we automatically say to ourselves, we're gonna use the exponential growth or decay model. You don't have to go through the pro process of saying, oh, you know, D, Y, D, T equals C, or sorry, equals K times Y, and then solving and getting Y of T equal to C equal to T. We don't have to do that, we can just jump to that. Now, we do need to actually solve for the K value and the C value. C is typically pretty easy. We're almost always gonna use the initial conditions to solve for C. So we know that at time zero, the population is 200 cells. Those are my initial conditions. If I plug those in, well, let's see what I get. Y of zero is equal to C times E to the K times zero. We know that's equal to 200. Oh, well, E to the zero is one. So I've got C times one equals 200. So C equals 200. If you've ever seen this before, I'm sure you're very aware that, oh yeah, the constant out in front here is just the amount of stuff you have at time zero. If you don't know what's happening at time zero, it's a little more challenging to figure out what that is, but most of the time they're like, oh yeah, here's your starting point. Great, that's the number that goes there. And then we have a little more information. We know that one hour later, the population is 840 cells. So now we're gonna plug that in with the C value also substituted in. Say we know that Y of T is 200 e to the kt and then we're going to plug in t equal to one and k equal to sorry and y equal to 840 so we're going to have 840 for y equals 200 e to the k times one right so it's one and then we're going to solve for k and then i'll mention that some people like to do this differently no i don't think Actually, so 840 divided by 200 is going to be 84 over 20, which probably reduces a little bit more. Yeah, we can reduce that to 21 fifths. Take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of 21 fifths equals the natural log of e to the k. There's our k value. So here's our answer to the first question. At any time t, the population is going to be y of t equals 200 e to the k is natural log of 21 fifths times t. It's possible you've seen a different way to do this, which is totally fine. Um, there is another way of solving this equation, like finding this solution. And I don't, sometimes some people cover it in 17 and sometimes they don't. I'll mention it briefly here. If you know some data like this, there's an easier way of getting to this. Maybe not easier, it's a different way of getting there. So here's what's always true about exponential growth or decay. In the same, if the same amount of time keeps passing, the population multiplies by the same amount every 
so many hours. So in one hour, this is not a great number, in one hour, what's the population multiplied by here? Okay. 21 fifths. After one hour, the population multiplied by 21 fifths. And after another hour, the same thing would happen. And time equals two hours, we would also multiply by 21 fifths. And so on to get all the values. People usually say something a little nicer, like the doubling time is always the same. So however long it takes for this population to double is always how long it takes. So if it takes, well, it probably takes less than an hour, but if it takes like half an hour to double, it's always half an hour to double. So half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, each time you're gonna double. So the multiplying by whatever number of time is always a constant. So there's a nice kind of way to figure out what this formula is. Here's what it is. Y of t is gonna be the initial match you started with. And then you're going to take your multiplication factor, which is 21 fifths, and raise it to the tth power. This is an alternatively correct formula. You can probably see it if you recognize that, oh, e to the natural log of 21 fifths times t, I'm going to put out in front. So what I'm really going to do with that t is make it the exponent of 21 fifths. And then you've got e to the natural log of 21 fifths to the t, and e to the natural log of some stuff is just this stuff. So this formula and this formula really are the same. I never learned it this way when I was a student, but I know students have told me, oh, James, this is easier way of doing it that I've always seen. So this is another way you can get there. If you know the multiple, if you know how long it takes to multiply by a certain amount, that amount is always the same. Um, so yeah, we'll do another. I'll, we'll do another example with slightly nicer numbers to kind of talk about that. Well, let's. We're not quite done with this example yet. If after you find the model, then then you can answer some other questions, like how many bacteria will there be? You guys would put, maybe like to see what I'm writing. Yes, how many bacteria? after three hours. People find this question challenging for one reason, because it's not phrased very well. So if you look back at our setup, which was you know, time equals zero, so time and amount, at zero we had 200, and after one hour we had 840. And our model is this. So what should I be setting t equal to? It's probably, I mean, you guys are right, it's three. But some people I've seen in the past have said it's four. Because like, well, they mean three hours after the most recent time they did. They don't mean that. They almost never mean that. So if ever, if ever they're asking you how much stuff there is at a certain time, the time should always be thought of as being measured from the initial time equals zero, unless they've made it explicitly clear that that's not the case. So yeah, we're gonna plug in time equal to zero. And we're gonna get y of t equal to 200 e to the natural log of 21 fifths times three, which is just calculator work at that point. You can use the calculator. I've got it right here. It's gonna be uh, 14,814 approximately. You could also write calculate it as 200 times 21 fifths to the third power. It would give you the same number. So people usually like to ask the questions like, how many things are there at this certain time? Or the other type of question, what time is it when there's this many things? So we asked one, how many are there after three hours? We can also ask, um, when will the population reach 20,000? So instead of setting time equal to something and solving for population, we're going to set the population equal to something and solve for time. 
So we're going to get 10,000 equal to 200 e to the natural log of 21 to t. And then we're going to solve for t. So we're going to divide by 200. 10,000 divided by 200. Sorry, I feel like I said 20,000, I wrote 10,000. Apologies. 20,000. 20,000. 20,000 divided by 200 equals e to the natural log of 21 fifths t. And then 20,000 over 200 is 100. And then we're going to take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of 100 equals the natural log of e to all this stuff is just all of this stuff. And then finally, we would divide by the natural log of 21 fifths. So T is going to end up equaling the natural log of 100 divided by the natural log of 21 fifths. And there isn't really any good way to simplify that. That's just kind of what it is. With a calculator, you get approximately 3.2 hours. Um, there is one other type of question I've seen actually pop up on various homework assignments is they ask you what the rate of growth is at a certain time. So we can have how many bacteria at a certain time, we need how much time does it take to get to a certain population. And then we can also ask, what's the rate of growth after, let's say, I don't know, three hours. So the way I would think about this is I would go back to kind of the beginning. We know that for these kinds of problems, the rate of growth is K times the population size. That's, I feel like most of the time that's what they want you to do. You can totally take the derivative of this and plug it in there, but I honestly think this is kind of easier. I know, well, not, I know it's easier this way. I don't want to start with, y equal to 200 e to the garbage times t and take the derivative of that. I don't need to do that because all of these exponential growth situations are coming from this initial situation. It's always true. If someone says exponential growth, you should immediately think, oh, the rate of growth is proportional to the population size. Always true for exponential growth or decay. So they're asking me, what's the rate of growth after three hours? Okay, well, hmm, I don't see a place to plug in three. Because I haven't been very good with my notation. Ah, that's not my notation. It's because I haven't been as explicit as I might want to be. dy dt is k times y of t. And y is a function of time. So I'm going to plug in three for there. I'm going to get. Well, let's see, k was natural log of 21 fifths, and everyone's favorite number. And y of t, well, there's my y. I'm going to plug in 3 and get 200 times e to the natural log of 21 fifths times 3. And then it's something. I don't want to it's approximately uh, 21,000, 21,264. What? In fact, that's a good question from before. Well, in fact, no, before we answer those questions, right? When they asked how long, how many bacteria after three hours, we got this many bacteria. And here, when we took how long, it was 3.2 hours. So the rest of the rate of growth, we're asking how many bacteria per unit of time. So it should be 21,264 bacteria per what? Yeah. Or bacteria is, I don't know. I don't care. It's a math class, not me. So, right, so that's what we're saying is that at, at the moment that three hours occurs, this population is growing at about 20,000 bacteria per hour. It'd be different at four, right? When we plug in four, we're going to get a different number out. 